This is Dick Lubke. Dick Lubke has been a presenter for Ichthyology and Aquatic Habitats in our chapter for I'm not sure how many years. Probably over 20. Over 20. And the part that we love about it is that he actually has a real demonstration with the fish that he caught yesterday. So you'll hear more about where they came from and what they are. The most He's from Wisconsin. He's been in, how long have you been in the Hill Country? 47 years. 47 years. And he retired 33 years ago from the Texas Parks and Wildlife. So he is a tenured ichthyologist. He worked for the Heart of the Hills Fishery Science Center in Mountain Home and was the director of research and that's why he knows his specimens. Wait till you hear what he's got. I got to hear a lot of this yesterday on the phone and I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, what he has to share in this season about the fish he caught is different from what I heard in the fall season of 2019. So uh, we're all in for another learning experience and thanks for playing with us today with this uh, different way of presenting ichthyology. We'll do our best, okay? Catherine okay, Dalton, and she is the communication director for the board of directors for our whole chapter. And she has, she and this camera have become sort of a way of managing uh, communication during the pandemic because she's pretty, she's the one that posts a lot on Facebook Live besides Pat with her photos of everything. So you see these two ladies with their cameras, you know it's gonna end up somewhere in the social media for the chapter. So thank you, Catherine, for creating this. Sure. Bear with me for just a second while I get this set up. I was explaining to Cheryl the other day that uh, this is uh, a PowerPoint presentation that I that I do. They're my notes, <laughs> so I have to have some. I have to have that. Uh, otherwise, I think we're going to lose a little little bit here. But bear with me. This thing doesn't want to totally cooperate, but we'll get it. So did you catch your samples with a rod and reel, or are you saning? For... We used electrofishing oh. and some saning a day before. But I uh, how you're so confident that you wait till the day before. To get your <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay. I apologize for the delay on that. Uh, before we, I get started, I just want to make sure everybody, and I'm sure the this has already been taken care of, but. I want to talk about the handouts that uh, you know, I'm guessing they're in uh, what, the notebook or something like that. Uh, got some uh, references, general references on aquatics. Uh, you'll look at the dates on most of those. You'll you'll find they're, they're what I call oldies but goodies, uh, and uh, uh, that's for, for your your benefit when you have time to look at things. Then I've also got some some uh, handouts on freshwater fish identification references. Uh, don't go with pictures. Go with keys. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to identification, uh, that's just the, the, the way it works. Uh, I've also uh, had, had a handout that, that has some, some of the general um, uh, anatomical features that are, are referenced in the dichotomous keys and the, and the other references, so that takes care of that. Now, as far as, as my presentation this morning, uh, what I would like to do is uh, tell you what, what I... What I what I'm going to, you know, the, the sequence of things. I'm going to first of all talk a little bit about where, what is water, and where does it come from, what does it do, how does it work. Um, I mean, that's what aquatics is—is is water, okay? And then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about stream anatomy, uh, how do streams work, uh, especially streams in this part of the world, because they're different from streams elsewhere uh, within any given watershed. We're near the headwaters of, of most of things out here, so we're in a little bit different. Uh, ball field than they play on, uh, say, down in the coastal prairie, for example. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, different kinds of stream habitats, and more importantly, you're going to talk about the the inhabitants of the habitats. Uh, and I'm a fish guy, okay? I have been, always will be. Uh, I'm, I, I know a little bit about invertebrates and things of that nature, obviously, but uh, uh, and I will mention some of those things, but, but primarily I'm going to focus on the fish, okay? Because it'll dovetail nicely, hopefully, and later on when we get the, the real specimens laid out on the table, we can do the touchy-feely, you know, things. Uh, so anyway, I'm going I'm to focus on the fish. 
and because uh, within the, the aquatic environments in Texas, uh, impounded waters are so important. Um, you know, we don't have uh, uh, natural lakes in the, in the state of Texas with the exception of Caddo, uh, but we have a lot of, of, of water that, that acts like, like a lake, um, being farm, be it from farm ponds to the big, big major reservoirs we have. That's standing water, that's not moving water. Uh, so, uh, entirely different kind of environment, uh, and some different fish assemblages live there than would normally live, you know, in the, in the stream environments, okay? We're going to talk a little bit about impounded waters. Talk a little bit about some of the water issues that we face in the state of Texas, um, and not just the state of Texas, really everywhere. But uh, talk a little bit about that, and uh, then uh, 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 and throughout this thing, if anybody has any questions, normally uh, I ask the questions to be reserved for the end because there's another speaker ready to go in the wings, and we're on a tight schedule and all that. I understand that's not the case today, so we can freeform if you like, but uh, just whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, you're you're having to also go through the presentation. You being the the the, the present audience here, um, you're having to do it without having the slides in front of you that, that I have. Okay, so that may that may generate more questions than than, than usual. As we but, go and take as long as we need to. And uh, uh, but anyway, and then of course at the end uh, when 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 I run out of out of words. Uh, uh, we'll take a little bit of a break, give me a chance to get this stuff out of the way, bring the fish in, get them spread out on the table, and then we can get up close and personal, and if you do it right, you can go home smelling like a fish, and, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and I mean, that's the fun part. I, I always say show and tell was, was fun when you were in kindergarten, and it's still fun, okay? I mean, I, I, I look forward to this, this day every year so that I can, can play with some more fish, <laughs> okay? Anyway. So let's talk a little bit about water. Now, water, uh, um, and when you get to see this presentation on, on your, your, your screens uh, at home, you'll see a, a slide that has the, what people call, it's, it's the, 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 the um, uh, hydrologic cycle, the water cycle, okay? And what's nice about it, I, I, got, I, I found a, 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 a graphic on, on the, on the uh, internet that I borrowed for this, and it is, it's, I like it because it shows where on planet Earth every single molecule of water is, okay? Because water is water. I don't care if it's in the ocean, or if it's in a stream, or if it's underground, it's the same water, okay? And it moves, okay? It moves from place to place, and that's what's wonderful about the hydrologic cycle. It kind of gives you some perspective on you know, the water. For example, you, uh, you dig a well. The water that comes out of your well uh, once you get it out of the ground and you know put it in your you know in your faucet and then send it out to your septic system it, it goes it, it's no longer groundwater it's going someplace else it's doing different things uh, mother nature does the same thing uh, we have basically two major forces uh, that, that work on the water on the planet uh, one is evaporation okay we have you know atmospheric evaporation so surface water anywhere on the on the surface of the planet has the opportunity to evaporate into the atmosphere okay and then you look out there today we see a lot of water up there if you if you just think about these clouds that's all water okay and that water is moving around with the winds and it's going from one place to the other so it's being transported you know from side to side as well as from up up to down okay now this afternoon maybe we'll get a shower some of that water that's in the atmosphere will precipitate to the surface of the earth okay and then it has several options available to it okay it can turn around and be re-evaporated again you know if it sits out where the sun shines on it and it's laying on top of a rock it's not going anywhere okay but uh, if it percolates into the ground that's one thing it can do another thing it can do is it can run off if there's a lot of it more than can can soak in at, at any given time uh, it'll 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 start uh, moving downhill gravity is a wonderful thing it works 24 7 and it's pulling that water down to where it wants to go which is the ocean okay so it's going to start on the surface somewhere and it's going to start working its way downhill all right and uh, then once it gets out into the ocean then it's available to be picked up with the evaporation again. In the meantime, uh, some of the stuff falls, you know, soaked up in the roots of the trees. What happens when the trees get water? They transpire, you know, water goes into the, you know, water vapor gets given away. Uh, I'm sure you've been told about the difference between a mesquite tree and an oak tree and things like that in terms of uh, evapotranspiration. 
uh, you know, they give off water to the atmosphere. Uh, so again, it, this water is forever moving. And the, the thing that I like to stress to people is, don't think uh, that the water that's in the in the groundwater, for example, don't think that that's anything different than the water that's falling down Cibolo Creek. It's the same water. It just happens to be at any given point in time residing someplace else. That groundwater is also moving with gravity. It's trying to go downhill. It's underground, but it's still going, you know, gravity's pulling it down. It's going, heading toward the ocean, okay? So that's why, uh, you know, what, what you, you suck out of the aquifer. A lot, for example, a lot of our springs, they're, they're drying up because we have so many wells being dug that are sucking water out of the ground. Uh, and if you have a favorite spring that you like looking at, go look at it because it may not be there for long because we have more and more straw sucking. Uh, but uh, once that water is, is eliminated, if it were to be eliminated, then it can't go anymore. You know, it's going to have to be replaced. And some of that water has been there for hundreds, shoot, thousands of years, okay? So, uh, anyway, water is very important. It's, it's extremely important, okay? Uh, in the hill country where we live, okay, we're blessed to be able to be in an area where there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of natural springs, okay? the headwaters, if you will, of, of a lot of streams and, and rivers are right in this general area on the Edwards Plateau of, of Central Texas. And uh, the water uh, uh, that, that we deal with, at least the surface water, is, is, is primarily coming from these springs, okay? Now the springs will uh, come, up, come out of the ground and then they will uh, start heading downhill, okay? This is, say, the elevation of the spring when it comes out of the ground. This is the ocean, okay? It's trying to go down there, and it will go down there uh, if it doesn't get evaporated or, or some other otherwise used. But remind yourselves always that it's not a, a, a straight line from here to there. It's not like that. Instead, it's like this, okay? What happens in most of our streams is we have a, a much more severe gradient, if you will, near the headwater, so water is, is moving downhill quickly, okay? And uh, as it gets closer to the, to the ocean, the gradient is much more reduced. That's where it's almost a flat line, okay? So it's still going downhill, but it's, it's, it's almost imperceptible because there's not much of a gradient down there. Now, in the hill country, uh, where we have the steeper gradients uh, in the headwaters of these streams, uh, you have, uh, uh, instead of, of water, you know, going at, say, that angle, instead it's going as a stair step. It goes, you know, it goes downhill steeply, but it's going in stair step fashion. And what our streams have is, in general terms at least, they have what we call pools and riffles. Riffles is the fast water, where it's, it's steeply going down. If you look at a stream, Especially if you get down close and personal with it, you can see, my gosh, it's coming down, it's coming down the hill. But it goes in a stair-step fashion. So you have fast water, which is the riffles, and then you have slow water, which is the pools. Now in the riffles, you have that faster moving water. It's removed a lot of those finer particles of sediments and whatnot, so a lot of a lot of gravel and rocks and things of that nature. And then once it gets down into that, you know, the pool where it's it's not moving as, as fast downstream. Uh, you have more sediment build up, uh, finer particles. You have aquatic vegetation that can't grow in, in the riffles, okay? Because uh, there's nothing, there's no substrate for them to grow in. So you have these different habitats, and then you have different kinds of uh, uh, aquatic communities that live in those different habitats. You, you've got species that like the current, you've got species that don't like the current. And, and uh, uh, they've evolved to, to make a living in these different places, and we'll, we'll you know, show you some of those things and talk about them a little bit uh, as, as we go. Now, one of the, the, the springs is my favorite because uh, I'm, I'm so familiar with it. The largest spring in Kerr County, uh, I realize this is Kendall County, but in Kerr County, the largest spring is, is the spring that provides water for the place that I worked for 29 years, uh, Heart of the Hills Fishery Science Center. And uh, uh, that spring uh, comes out of the ground at 69 degrees all year long, never varies one bit. Uh, and it's a, it's a heck of a gusher, okay? It's, like I say, it's the biggest spring in, in, in Kerr County. And uh, uh, when the water comes out of the ground, uh, because it may have resided there for thousands of years, depending on how far you know, any given molecule came from, but uh, it's very, very pristine and pure. It has hardly any nutrients in it, if, if any at all. Uh, it's mostly 
hydrogen and oxygen, <laughs> plain and simple, okay? So it's, it's, uh, it lacks productivity. There's, there's nothing in there that makes anything want to grow. So if you look at the spring uh, communities, if you will, of the, the, in the things that live there, uh, be it invertebrates, be it uh, uh, fish, um, um, they're very limited, okay? So you don't have a lot of variety. You've got a few species that have figured out how to live in a, in a, in a kind of sterile environment, if you will. And uh, uh, so you have uh, uh, fish that, that, that uh, you know, can eke out an existence when there's not much to eke out. Uh, uh, and you have, you have a limited number of invertebrates. Uh, the spring I'm mentioning, uh, especially up in, in Kerr County, um, if you go look at the rocks around the spring in the pool where the water comes out, they're covered with little black speckles, you know? And, and, and if you get down on your hands and knees and look and say, what are these little black speckles? They're snails. And it's, and it's because there's no fish that eat snails right there. <laughs> There's not enough other things that, to, to make them want to live there. So uh, the snails proliferate and they just are they're wonderful because it's like, wow, nobody's trying to eat us. This is a good place to live. And uh, you know, you have a few other things. You have some, you know, you have some crayfish and salamanders and things like that. Uh, you have very few different kinds of fish. You don't have a lot of predator fish. You have uh, things like round nose minnows which you can only find in these spring heads you go downstream on any in any any stream that has uh, uh round nose minnows at the, at the headwaters you go downstream a half a mile you're not going to see them they're gone and the reason they're gone is because as you go further downstream the the whole uh, uh mixture of things that are there is, is gradually changing it's becoming more productive leaves are falling in the water and you know, the deer are running through the water and, and dropping a little something as they go, and, and all of that stuff adds to the productivity. So you start getting a more diverse community building up. You start having things that have mouths on that want to eat other fish. <laughs> and probably, my guess would be, the reason you don't see spring minnows, I mean, around those minnows further downstream is they don't know how to avoid being eaten. And when they get down where there's large mild bass or Guadalupe bass or something like that, they're gone. Okay, but they do really well where they where they where they can be. So um, anyway, it's kind of interesting. You also have some uh, darters, and I think I, I brought a darter to show you. Uh, darters are called darters because they tend to uh, uh, lay on the bottom, and when a food particle comes by, they dart out and grab it and just fall back to the bottom. You know, that's just what they do. So they're called darters, and there's a whole family of these things. And I've got a couple different darters that are brought to show you and uh but green throat darters are the ones that are the most common in in the spring areas uh, they're called green throats because in the winter time they're one of the few species of fish that spawn in the winter and uh they their 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 throat uh, uh turns a very vivid dark green it's gorgeous you don't see it in, in other time of the year when they're not in their breeding colors uh, Cheryl mentioned that, that uh, the fish that you're going to see, uh, I was amazed yesterday. I, I mean, I, I shouldn't have been amazed. I just I don't think about these things every day. And when you see it, it's, there's the visual reminder. This is April. We normally do this class in October. So I'm normally out there chasing fish in October. Most of the fish have already spawned in October. So they're back to their, it's not to a fish's advantage think about it. Is, is it to their advantage to be brightly colored like a clown? Of course not, because everybody's going to pick them off, okay? So they do that, however, to attract a mate and do all those kind of things. And uh, so uh, uh, if you go out there in April, which is, today is April, uh, yesterday when those fish were collected, I was amazed with the, the color of, 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 of a lot of the species because they're in the middle of, of reproduction right now. So I've got, and unfortunately fish, I'll make excuses now, but fish tend to fade when they're on ice for a while. And these fish were collected yesterday morning. I've kept them on ice in the garage all night and they're fine. They're fresh and all that good stuff, but they just have lost some of their color, but they still have a lot of it. So you're gonna see some pretty fish, okay? Um, anyway, now as, as the, the streams start going away from the, the spring heads and start moving downstream, Again, you, you, you have a lot of things starting to come into the water. They're, they're getting more and more productive. You're getting more and more different kinds of habitats uh, and uh, uh, things are, are gradually changing, okay? 
and they're still going through this normal stair step process of going downhill because we're near the headwaters here and uh, so you have your pools and riffles but then you have your little eddies off to the side uh, you just have a lot of different kinds of, of, of habitats uh, especially micro habitats you know people you know they don't tend to understand sometimes that you know what's under that particular species of vegetation in the way of maybe a, a, a little beetle or, or something like that can be drastically different from what's under this particular species of vegetation because there's there's subtle differences between the two and, and the same thing holds true in the aquatic environment these micro habitats um, I, I, I can't help but remind myself that when I was in graduate school I took a, a, a course in, in, in marine ichthyology down on the coast and we had to go out and collect fish all the time uh, and as part of the class and we were graded by how many different species we could get okay the, the ones who got the most species got the best grades plain and simple so how do you get the most species you 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 home in real quickly on micro habitats for example on the coast you know there's miles and miles and miles of everything that looks the same <laughs> and quite frankly it is the same but you look for something different okay for example i remember vividly one day there was a, a pilot that had a, a marker for a channel or something on it you know and it was about this big around and it was stuck in the sand and there was nothing but bare sand around there and there's fish out there don't get me wrong but if you don't drag your seine right along the edge of that piling, you know, there's two or three species of fish there that are not out there 10 feet away. And we learn very quickly, you look for anything that's different, microhabitats. So places where there's sun and versus shade versus vegetation versus rocks, different species assemblages and all of those microhabitats. So it becomes more and more complex as you go downstream. So maybe maybe some people don't find it fascinating i do okay uh one of the things we have in the hill country that you're not going to see further downstream we have what i call sh uh, sheet water where you, the water's going across a, a, a just a limestone you know it's almost like a like a like a floor <laughs> there's nothing there except just just slick limestone the water might be an inch or two deep at the most uh, but guess what it does it provides a wonderful opportunity for sun Sun is making that water warm and warm. The more the water gets warm, it gets more productive too because, you know, metabolism is based on temperature. And uh, so different kinds of habitats. And that's one that's kind of, kind of neat in the hill country. Um, maybe you've been able to go out and see some of the places in our hill country streams where you can see the wagon tracks, you know, the two ruts in the thing. I mean, some of these ranches, I've been on a bunch of them. And, and, you know, there's stories to be told there. I mean, people had their covered wagons going through the streams on that on that bedrock. Uh, and so, anyway, it's kind of kind of interesting, but that's some habitat that you won't see further downstream. Now, as we get further downstream, for example, the difference between Kerrville and here, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the rivers are becoming more and more, they're getting bigger, of course, because every time a tributary comes in, you know, the, the river itself gets, gets larger. And uh, we end up with more and more pool habitats, uh, slower water, uh, a lot less of the riffles, and uh, they're still there, but you have to almost use your imagination to see them because the water's a little deeper. And uh, so you have a lot of, a lot of, a lot more habitat, if you will. When you have more habitat, you have more opportunity for different species of fish. So you're starting to get a wider variety of species. And uh, as you come further downstream, not only do you get more different species of fish, but you get more and more different species of aquatic invertebrates, insects, uh, larvae, and things like that. Um, you know, you're not going to find helgamites, for example, up in the springhead. But boy, you go downstream a half a mile, and you know, Helgamite's the best fish bait that, that God ever put on this planet. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, they'll be there, and, and there'll be your caddisflies and things of that nature, all the aquatic insects. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we don't even associate with water, they're tied to the water. You know, of course, all your amphibians and things like that, they've got to go back and get to the water for reproduction. So, uh, but it's a, just a much more diverse system, okay? As far as fish species, things like uh, gar, for example, uh, long-nosed gar, and I, I got one of those yesterday. We don't usually get them, but we were fortunate enough yesterday to catch a real nice one, so we brought it for you. Uh, uh, if anybody's not familiar with gar, they've got a, a long beak on the front of them full of teeth. They don't chew their food with the teeth, but they use them to hang on to things. You know, they're, they're victims, if you will. <laughs> their prey items are, are uh, slimy, 
Uh, all fish have mucus on them, and uh, a lot of the, the adaptations the different species of predators have are based on, you know, keeping a hold of their prey once they get their mouth on them because if they don't keep them if they don't if they're not able to keep the prey the prey gets away and they got to go look for another meal so anyway gar have all those teeth and it's, it's just made uh, you look at their bodies uh, we'll go through a bunch of this when we get them on the table but they're wonderful camouflage you know uh, they're just blotchy uh, they don't spend a lot of energy just you know running around looking for food they spend a lot of energy finding the right place to sit still and let the food come to them. And then they've, they've got the ability to go out and grab it. And a lot of predators do that. So you'll have that. You'll have uh, another uh, example of, of some of the variety. You've got uh, central stone rollers. They're a species that you'll find here in the hill country. You won't find them further downstream because as their name suggests, they roll stones for a living. And you say, what do you mean they roll stones? Okay, um, they, uh, they're, they're a demersal fish. They stay on the bottom. Their mouth is on the bottom of their head. You know, generally speaking, forgive me if I digress here, but generally speaking, if you're looking at a fish and you don't have any idea what it is, if you just use your head a little bit and think about what you're looking at, it tells you a lot about, it may not tell you the name, but it'll tell you what it does for a living. For example, if the fish has this mouth on the bottom of its head, does you think he lives on the surface or you think he swims around the middle? No, he's a bottom feeder. He's got like a little vacuum cleaner. He's sucking things off the bottom. These fish are called stone rollers because they tend to roll stones uh, with their, their heads and because the insect larvae uh, of a lot of different species are attached to the bottoms of those rocks and they know that. So they roll the stones and that's how they, and then they use their, their little sucker mouth to you know, suck it off the rock and they move over and roll another one. And uh, anyway, I think I have a stone, a stone roller in here to show you. Uh, just Again, the kind of species that you don't normally find in the, uh, other places, but you will find them in, in the headwater areas, you know, in, in the hill country. Uh, one of my favorite that's probably one of the most common minnows around here is a, a, a black tailed shiner. And if you can visualize a minnow, uh, or really for that matter, any fish, at the front end of the, of the, of the fish, you have eyeballs, one on each side, and, and they have, have the large pupils, you know, big black spot, if you will. Predators know that, that, that the brain is right there by those eyes, and that's where Command Central is. So you take out the head, you know, you've taken out the, the prey item. Okay, so uh, these minnows don't get very big. They're minnows. I mean, you get one this big, it's very large. Okay, so Mother Nature is kind of neat in the sense that she said, well, if you're not going to be able to get very big, we need to give you a little something to help you along here. Okay, because everybody in the world is out here trying to eat you. So what, what has happened with black nose minnows is uh, they have a very large black spot at the base of their tail. It's larger and more pronounced than the, the black pupil of their eyes. So when they're swimming around and their predator is, you know, he's like, everybody's moving. What's going on here? Oh, there's one. And if they grab, if they grab him by the tail, they're not going to, they're not going to get anything. So that gives the, the, the prey an, an opportunity to get away. Okay. And uh, anyway, I just think it's kind of cool when you look at some of these things. And I believe I've got at least one or two in there that I can, can show you. But the spot on the tail is much bigger than the spot on the eye. Uh, another species of minnow that's really common around here uh, uh, is a Texas Shiner. Yeah, what a nice name. Uh, they're they're a relatively small, rare, rare, rarely see three inches. Uh, they tend to live in really fast water. Now, if they're living in fast water, what's happening is all of the food items that are in there, little microscopic things that you know we can't even hardly see, they they're, they're zipping by at warp speed, you know, and they've got to be able to you know to find them and, and catch them. They have huge eyes. Their eyes, and they're they're not huge because it's a little fish, but if you look at proportional to the rest of the fish, the eye is almost the entire distance between the top of the, the fish's head and the bottom of the fish. It's all eye because they've got to be able to have incredible eyesight to see these things come zipping by and because they live in that particular type of an environment, that particular type of microhabitat, if you will. When the water slows down at the end of the riffle, they're not there because they make a living up there where it's fast. So everybody has their home. It's kind of like different species of trees live in different places and different species of flowers and grass and all those things. It's the same thing in the aquatic world. It's just mostly they're hiding out there and we don't get to see it. It's, uh, Another one of the common species around here in the hill country is a gray red horse. Uh, they uh, uh, 
again, a, a fish that has a, a, a mouth on the bottom of their head. They live on the bottom. They're kind of brownish in color. We've got several of those. I brought a big one and a little one just to show you the, some of the differences in size. But uh, that's a fish that I can set it on the table on its, on its stomach and let it alone. It won't, roll, it won't fall over because it's flat on the bottom. It tells you, again, if you didn't have any idea what this thing is and you look at it and say, oh, his mouth's on the bottom. And, yeah, he lives on the bottom. Another thing on fish, uh, you can notice it when we look at these fish later on. Um, they tend to be uh, dark on the top and light on the bottom. Why? Why aren't they the same color everywhere? If you think about it, go lay on, the, go lay on your back out on, in a stream somewhere on a lake and look up. Do you see anything that's dark? <laughs> no, you see the sky. It's light colored. So if a fish looks at another fish from below and they have a light belly on them, they're going to they're gonna blend in and disappear. The same thing with, and this is a good example of these gray red horse, they're kind of brownish. What's the color of the substrate out there in the stream mostly? Mostly kind of brownish. So you can't see them. And uh, anyway, they're just kind of one of the members of the sucker family. Uh, one that most people um, maybe have never heard of and, and certainly don't appreciate, but they should. Um, uh, if I ask you, does anybody know what the, what the purple martin of the fish world is? Yeah. Mosquito fish. Have you ever heard of a mosquito fish? Gambusia? Okay, it's a little bitty minnow that's about this big, and, and it's, it's a weird fish in the sense that it's a live bear. Very few fish are live bears. Most of them lay eggs. These guys uh, actually give birth to live young. But their mouth is actually pointed up. What's that all about? Well, think about it. It's, it's, it's about picking off things that are above it, okay? What does a mosquito do when, when and it's in the aquatic uh, phase of its life? You know, the mosquito with larvae, they come up to the surface to get air, right? And they come back down. These guys are picking them off. That's why I say they're the purple martins of the fish world. I, I always tell people, if you got a stock tank out at, out, out at the ranch, you know, and it, you complain, because every time you go out there, you cover it up with mosquitoes, put a few of these guys in there. And especially when there's no predators there, they'll do just fine. But they're mosquito fish, they eat mosquitoes. That's pretty much all they do for a living is eat mosquitoes. Wonderful friends, okay? Purple martins of the fish world, mosquito fish. We have a wide assemblage of, of sunfishes, uh, uh, what people in Texas tend to collectively call perch. Uh, there's about eight or nine different species, uh, but the most common one is, is the bluegill, uh, it's found throughout North America, uh, different subspecies here and there, but basically they all look the same and they all behave the same. Uh, most of these fish are, they have small mouths, they're, they're deep bodied fish, um, and uh, so they eat uh, invertebrates. Uh, insects, things of that nature. They have small minnows if they can get them in their mouth. Okay. Uh, anyway, bluegills. Then we have one uh, called. Uh Especially when there's no predators there, they'll do just fine. But they're mosquito fish, they eat mosquitoes. That's pretty much all they do for a living is eat mosquitoes. Wonderful friends, okay? And purple martins of the fish world, mosquito fish. We have a wide assemblage of, of sunfishes, uh, uh, what people in Texas tend to collectively call perch. Uh, there's about eight or nine different species, uh, but the most common one is, is the bluegill. Uh, it's found throughout North America. Uh, different subspecies here and there, but basically they all look the same and they all behave the same. Uh, most of these fish are, they have small mouths, they're, they're deep bodied fish, um, and uh, uh, so they eat uh, invertebrates, uh, insects, things of that nature. They have small minnows if they can get them in their mouth, okay? Uh, anyway, bluegills, then we have one uh, called, uh, uh, people around here call them yellow bellies, they're actually red breast sunfish. Uh, they've got a very elongated ear flap, and you'll see I've got some of those. And again, all of these fish right now are in breeding color, so I tried to get males and females to show you the differences, and you know, hopefully they haven't faded out too badly. 
but uh, uh, they've got a little bit bigger mouth. You know, again, if you, you hold two different species of sunfish and say, well, this one's got a bigger mouth than that one. Well, I can tell you right now, if he's got a bigger mouth than that one, that means he eats a few more small minnows and things because he can fit them in his mouth. This guy can't, okay? Uh, I always tell the school kids when I show them a bluegill, they're, they're short and stocky. They're like little round guys, you know? And you say, do you think this fish can swim very fast? Is he shaped like a torpedo where he can cut through the water? No, he's a little porker. <laughs> okay, well, he doesn't have to swim fast, okay? And what does he eat for a living? He eats little aquatic insects. Do you think they're zipping through the water, you know, at Mach 6? I don't think so. They're crawling along, so he doesn't have to go fast. Now, if he can't go fast and he eats little things, he's not going to get real big. He's going to be a small fish. Other fish are going to try to eat him because he's small. There's other fish, like a largemouth bass, for example. So Mother Nature, again, says, if you're going to be a little fish <laughs> and you're not going to move around very fast, I'm going to give you a, at least a little bit of an advantage. So what does they have on the top of their body? They have all these dorsal spines that stick up. I mean, they'll poke holes in you. Um, and they also, because they, they get enlarged from top to bottom, okay, a fish can't get them in their mouth. <laughs> they're, too, they're too tall, if you will. Okay, and all the sunfishes fall into that category. Okay, uh, a big one is a pound. Uh, so you know, there's lots of predators out there that want to eat them. Uh, so anyway, it's it's kind of neat how they all have their different adaptations to to survive out there in the real world. We have another one that that uh, uh, I I actually fish for them a lot myself. They're they're called uh, red ear sunfish. They have a, a distinct red ear on their uh, opercular flap. Uh, uh, in Florida, they call them shell crackers. The reason they call them shell crackers is they eat snails. So they're always in the vegetation where the snails are. The snails are feeding on the vegetation. They're going in there picking off the snails. And when you fillet one, as, you, as your knife goes through it, you can hear it go crunch, 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 because it's cutting through snails. Uh, again, they call them shell crackers. They're redder sunfish. This is also the home to the state fish of Texas. Anybody know what that is? Guadalupe bass. Okay. We're the only state in, in the country that has the Guadalupe bass. This is it right here in the hill country uh, is, where they, is where they live. Uh, they're, they, they're a member of the, of the bass family. Uh, well, actually, they're a member of the sunfish family, but they're, they're shaped and look a lot like largemouth bass. I have a couple of them, but they're relatively small. We couldn't get any bigger ones. But uh, uh, they're, they're, they're more of a... a uh, uh, midstream fish, mid to upper stream fish. Uh, they they like fast water. They, you catch them below riffles and things like that. We got the fish that I'm going to show you later uh, at Flat Rock Lake in Kerrville. Um, there's not any riffles there, but there are some Guadalupe bass that probably washed in from upstream during a you know, flood event or something like that. So we got some of those. They're they're kind of cool. I told you that I had some darters to show you. Uh, uh, one of my favorite is the log perch. I got a couple of those to show you there. They're long and skinny, uh, like, like a cigar. They've got tiger stripes on them for camouflage. And their, their darters are so cool in a, in a home aquarium because they've got a personality. It's kind of like, a, if you're familiar with saltwater fish, uh, blennies, uh, 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 they, 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 they're, just, they're animated. They, they get up and they look around and they just they have a personality. And uh, anyway, but they're, they got those tiger stripes on them, so they're really cool. But uh, they don't get very big. I think we've got a couple of them, maybe this big at the, at the most. But uh, okay, now, again, as we start moving downstream uh, in, in our, 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 our streams here, uh, you get more and more of the, the quiet water habitats. Like I say, you, there may be some riffles out here, but you don't even see them because there's, there's deep water over the top of them. The gradient is becoming a lot less, okay? Once it falls off the plateau, it's a whole different world, even, even more so. But up here, it's more of the quiet, meandering river. You know, you'll still f see a few riffles, but it's mostly the quiet water. So you have, you know, that, that, that non-movement type water. You start getting your, big, what I call big water fish. Um, uh, you'll get all, the, all these uh, cypress trees, for example, that are over the water providing all that shade and whatnot. It's, it's just a lot of opportunities. I mean, look at, I mean, we're standing here in, in, <laughs> in leaves, okay? This is, where did they come from? They came from all these trees. Same thing happens in the streams. You know, look at one of these rivers around here. Look at Cibolo Creek in the fall, when, uh, in the winter, when the, the, the cypress trees are losing all their needles. I mean, it's just a solid mat of needles floating downstream. 
um, that's they're gonna they're gonna decompose in there and, and they're gonna add nutrients. There's all kinds of insects and things falling in that. Anybody who likes fishing knows you go fish under a pecan tree where it hangs over the water, you know, and throw a so something that's green because these little green caterpillars are falling off those leaves and there's fish under there just stacked up waiting for this is a dinner bell. Okay? So all these different kinds of habitats, but it's a non-movement kind of kind of habitat, more more big water. Okay? Uh, lots and lots of different kinds of habitat micro habitats. Again, I like to show people when this, it's not a sunny day today, but when the sun comes out, you know, you'll have something that looks pretty much uniform in the water, but there's a line, a shade line. This is covered by a tree and this isn't. There's going to be different fish there than there is there, just because of that, okay? Just microhabitat. It looks the same, just a little bit different, okay? Um, we have different kinds of fishes that live there, big, big water fish. We'll have fish like gizzard shad. Um, got you some gizzard shad yesterday. Uh, I'll let you pick those up. They're really, really slimy, but uh, uh, they're 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 the really the bread and butter forage species that so many of our predator fish eat. Shad, 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 shad. If you go where the shad are, you're going to be where the fish are that you want to catch. You know, I mean that's what most of your 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 devout fishermen look for is is the food. I mean think about it. All you got to do is go where the food is. I mean, where do we go on a Friday evening? <laughs> I mean, if it wasn't COVID, we'd be in a restaurant somewhere. And that's what you do. So if you can find the food, you find the fish and, and a lot of uh, shad. Now, shad are, are interesting in, in, in a lot of respects. They're, everybody in the world wants to eat them. That's not a nice thing if you're a shad. So again, Mother Nature says, well, you know, what are we gonna do with you guys? <laughs> you know, you're gonna be eliminated if we don't give you something. So they make them skinny this way. And shad, you know, I always do this. If you hold my hand this way, you can't see it. If I hold it this way, you can see it pretty good. So they're skinny from side to side. They're white because they swim around. They tend to swim around in, in the middle of the water column. Okay, so they're, they're shiny white, slimy as can be. So if a predator gets a hold of one and doesn't have a good, good grip on it, they slide right on out. Uh, they've got all those things going for them, just so that they can survive long enough to make more. So the cycle gets repeated again, but shad are kind of cool. We have a wide assemblage of catfishes. Uh, we were lucky yesterday we got some bullheads. I, quite honestly, I gotta look at them when I bring them on the table. I don't know if I have both black and yellow bullheads, but. We certainly have yellow bullheads. We got two species around here. Uh, they're small catfish. They tend to, you know, they might get this big, but they tend to be little guys. Um, I will say this on your catfish, all catfish, I don't care which species you're talking about, you have to be careful when you handle them. They have a spine that comes out of the middle of their back. They have two that come out the middle of the side up near the front. And most of those are barbed. I mean, they're, they have serrations on them. And if they stick it in you, it's not gonna come out without a lot of pain. And some of them even have a little bit of a little bit of venom uh, that will really, really irritate you. The, the, so be careful when I put these fish out. And feel free to touch them, but don't don't get real crazy with them, especially the the catfishes. Okay. Um, and of course, we have our channel catfish. I was fortunate yesterday we got not only a, a nice channel catfish, you know, just an average size channel catfish, but we also got a small one. Here's it heck of a difference between the little one and the big one. It's the same species, and I'll show you that. The little ones have speckles on them, the big ones don't. Uh, so, um, but you would think this isn't even channel catfish, this is something else, and so that's kind of neat. We have flathead catfish, We've got a little one of those. Normally we catch one that's about 20 pounds, and I don't want to kill a 20 pound flathead just to, sh you know, for show and tell. Um, so we tend to let those go. But yesterday we got a nice little one about this big. I said, oh, great. He's got all the features of, of the big guys, but he's less than a pound. So we've got one of those for you. It's a flathead catfish. Their names a lot of times will tell you about the fish. It's a flathead catfish and the head is very compressed and flattened. Um, around here, they, they're they really bad about changing colors with the water clarity. If they're in a clear water situation, they tend to be what a lot of folks will call ops, opelousa, like an opelousa horse. They've got blotches all over them, you know, that's what they do out in West Texas. You get that muddy water that just looks almost like soil. <laughs> uh, real murky, you can't see an inch into the water. Uh, they tend to get what everybody calls a yellow cat. They're kind of a yellowish color, but real, just solid color, no, no patterns to it. Um, and it's the same species of fish. 
So if you hear people call about flatheads, uh, yellow cat, ops, they're all the same. It's flathead catfish. Okay. Um, we have white bass. We got we got a couple of those yesterday. Uh, that's a species that that uh, is is kind of medium in terms of, of fish in the sense that it's not very tall from top to bottom compared to the rest of the you know the the dimensions. Uh, it uh, has a medium sized mouth. So medium sized mouth tells you right away it's not a it's not a top line carnivore. It can't eat big things with a medium sized mouth. It can only eat small minnows, but that's what white bass do for a living. They chase schools of minnows around. They tend to run up the rivers and spawn, uh, so they make a spawning run. Um, uh, they can't do it around here because we have too many dams <laughs> stopping them. But uh, uh, anyway, white bass, they've got stripes down the side. They're kind of silvery. Um, we also have uh, uh, other uh, sunfishes, uh, there's uh, such a variety in the sunfish family. We have a fish called a warmouth, and I brought some that were absolutely gorgeous. When we got them yesterday, I mean, I just, my mouth fell over. I said, look at the colors on these things. They've got a relatively large mouth for a sunfish. Uh, uh, tells you right away that they can eat, eat minnows. Uh, but the other thing is they're kind of brownish, so they tend to really, if you want to go catch one of those, go fish by a log. Find something that's brown and that's where they hang out. Or rocks that have the brown algae kind of stuff growing on it, slime, they like to hide in that. So anyway, uh, those are called uh, uh, war mouth. The reason they call them war mouth is if you open their mouth up and feel in there with your fingers, you can feel teeth on their tongue, on the roof, on the bottom, on the sides. I mean, they have teeth everywhere. And I'm not talking about sharp, pointy teeth. It's like sandpaper, but it's for grabbing a hold of things. Uh, anyway. Uh, we also have another fish that's similar to that, and I've got those as well, green sunfish. A green sunfish is another sunfish that has a medium-sized mouth, not very deep-bodied. Uh, 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 so they eat a lot of, a lot of minnows and, and things like that. They have some very distinctive markings on them in terms of spots and white thin margins and things, and I'll point that out when we, when we show them to you later on. And of course, largemouth bass. The fish everybody wants to catch in the state of Texas is largemouth bass. You know, uh, it's a big green fish with a big mouth. Okay, now let's talk about that for just a second. They're green. A lot of fish are not green. Bass are green. I wonder where they live. Do you think they live in the vegetation where it's green? I'll bet they do, yeah. Um, not always, but uh, uh, they spend a lot of time in green environments. They blend in. What better thing for a predator to do than blend in? Okay, they've got uh, a, a large mouth on them. I don't, other than the Guadalupe bass, that's the only other bass I have to show you. But on a large mouth bass, when their mouth is closed, the back of their jawbone will ex extend beyond their eye. Okay, and they're called a large mouth bass for that reason. Their mouth is very large. You open it up, and you know, you get a big one, you can put your whole fist in there. I mean, it, they, they have a, a yap on them, they can, they can grab anything. Um, and uh, smallmouth bass. Is, is different from a largemouth bass. Its mouth is smaller. <laughs> I mean, that's the name, right? Anyway, this is just a largemouth bass and, and the most popular sport fish in freshwater in Texas and really throughout the South. Uh, we have crappie. We have two species of crappie. We were able to get one yesterday. We have black crappie and white crappie, and we got a black crappie. Um, and uh, so we have that we can show you. That's another fish that's medium from terms from top to bottom, has a medium sized mouth. Uh, so they're, they're minnow eaters. They, uh, uh, they tend to be um, gregarious. They're, they're schooling fish. If you catch one, you should catch several, <laughs> or maybe more than several. Wonderful to eat. They're absolutely wonderful. So anyway, I've got one to show you. Uh, that's all we got yesterday. Fish like freshwater drum, uh, the, the, a lot of the species of fish that people fish for in, in, on the coast, uh, red drum, uh, black drum, uh, croaker, uh, you name it, uh, a, a lot of those fish on the coast, they're members of the drum family. The only member of the drum uh, family in freshwater is the freshwater drum. In the east, uh, I, when I first moved to Texas, I was stationed over in Houston, and we worked the lakes over in east Texas a lot, and we'd see these cardboard signs out on a country road, it'd say, fresh goo. It's like, what is that? It's Gasper Goo. It's short for Gasper Goo. That's what they call them. You know, if you want to go to Louisiana, you, there's a whole another bunch of names over there. But anyway, they're they're uh, uh, they've got special ear bones that that uh, they drum. And when it's spawning time, 
uh, if, if you just happen to be there at the right moment, at the right place, where these guys are doing their thing, they're actually drumming, and you can hear this rattling noise down in the water. So what is that? It's the drum that are drumming, um, and that's how they attract each other. Uh, there's a lot of things going on you don't even, you don't even know, <laughs> but they're kind of they're cool. They have uh, their... Well, I don't. We don't have any that we were able to catch. Uh, you have to go a little further downstream to catch those, but they're in big river fish. Uh, and then fish like buffalo. Uh, back in the day, uh, when I first came here, there was still commercial fishing going on. Uh, people going out with gill nets and things, catching buffalo. Uh, buffalo is is a, a, a member of the minnow family, but they get big and they're they're tasty. Uh, and and uh, anyway, you don't you'll never catch them probably on a rod and reel, but. But uh, they're cool. We, we, again, we're just a little too far upstream to have things like that, so we didn't catch any of those. Uh, one that we did catch yesterday, and, and I've got, got some in there, uh, it's a, a Rio Grande cichlid. Now, if you're familiar with cichlids uh, in the pet store, uh, they're fish that have uh, an elongated uh, anal fin and an elongated dorsal fin. So uh, you end up uh, with, with what looks almost like three tails, you know. Uh, they, they stick out toward the back, and this, this fish has a complete set of yellow polka dots from one end of their body to the other. Uh, they're, they're, they're the sort of fish that you say, ooh, I gotta have one of those for my aquarium. Don't ever do that. They will kill anything that you put in there. I don't care if it's ten times bigger than them, they will kill it. They will peck it to death. <laughs> uh, they don't play well with others. They're a mouth brooder like a lot of the cichlids. They actually, when they deposit their, their their, their eggs and they hatch. Uh, they'll actually suck them in their mouth to protect them if there's a predator comes by. And then when the predator goes away, they spit them back out. It's it's fun to watch with a, with them. You know, when you got a snorkel on, you just look at them and say, this is the craziest thing I ever saw. I mean, they just go, and all the little guys right in their mouth. And it's like, and here comes a bass swim by or something. And then when he's gone, they spit them back out. So. Uh, very, very few fish do that. The cichlids, uh, they're real common. Cichlids are common in Africa, uh, a little bit South America. Uh, this particular species, this is about as far north as it gets. Common in Mexico and South Texas, uh, uh, but it just doesn't get hardly. I don't think they're in the Llano. I think the Guadalupe is probably the furthest north river that, that they're in. Uh, but uh, they're, they're fun, they're beautiful, but uh, they don't play well with others. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about water when it gets off the, say, the plateau and starts getting down in the coastal plain. Remember, I said the water starts downhill steeply and then it, it gradually levels off. Now, once you get down in, you know, areas further downstream than us, the streams are generally bigger. You know, I mean, they, rivers get are supposed to get bigger and bigger as they go further and further downstream because more tributaries are coming in, right? Now, this is this is not in the presence of people sucking water out of the river and, and drying them up, you know, but normally they get bigger and bigger as they go downstream. So you have more and more energy, okay? You don't have any gradient, so it can't, it's, it's like a caged animal. It's, 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 gotta, it's gotta do something. So what, is it, what do our rivers do? They start meandering, okay? They start snaking. They don't go in a straight line. Uh, around here, they tend to go more in a straight line. and get further downstream, they'll, they'll start snaking. It's called meandering. Now, if you think about it, uh, Meandering does does two things. Uh, on the on the inside of a turn, on the inside of a turn, that's the minimum amount of, of flow, okay? And it's not very much to begin with, right? So it's moving slowly. So there's deposition going on all of the silt and sand particles and things of that nature that's in that water, okay, that it gathered up as it was coming downstream uh, when it was going faster, okay? It's all mixed up in the water. It tends to deposit on the inside turns. It's called deposition. And then on the outside of the turn, you know, to get around the turn, it's kind of like if there's a, several rows of cars making a curve, the ones on the inside don't have very far to go. <laughs> the ones on the outside, they got a long way to go. So that same amount of water is going around faster out there, so it's cutting. It's, it's cutting into the banks. And so the meandering, you know, as, it's, as it goes, you have deposition on the inside, cutting on the outside, and it, eventually it gets to the point where it literally cuts itself off, okay? And then you have what they call oxbow lakes, okay? We don't have any, they're really neat to see. If you ever fly, say, northeast of here, or actually just east of here, where you stay down on the, on the coast, say like you're going to uh, 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 
Atlanta or something like that, you'll cross over some rivers and look out the window of the plane, you'll see that meandering, and it's just crazy. Those oxbow lakes show up. Uh, but anyway, that's just something that, that water does in streams. Again, it's not something we experience in the hill country, but you know, it, it, it happens, you know, further downstream, okay? Um, now, let's talk a little bit about impounded waters. I said, you know, it's, it's, it's a big thing in Texas. We have reservoirs all over the place. And we have all different kinds of reservoirs. We have these little, uh, these little low water crossing things uh, around here. Uh, oftentimes, a road will act as a dam, <laughs> okay? Uh, and uh, so you have these things that are maybe, maybe six, eight, ten feet high at the most. You know, there's just tons of them. A lot of them were built back in the, in the 1930s, you know, during the Depression. And the WPA workers were out here putting these things in. A lot of ranchers put them in. Uh, and basically, it takes moving water and stops it, okay? Makes it a standstill situation. So it's like a lake, if you will. Okay, things behave different in that. We have uh, what I would call a medium size uh, example for uh, uh, the, the dam in Kerrville, the UGRA dam, uh, backs up in, in you know, the city of Kerrville, the Guadalupe River, and it provides water for the city of Kerrville, okay? Uh, and uh, then you go further downstream, and uh, you have to get a little further away from here, but you get lakes like Buck Cannon, where you have you know a very large river with a very large dam. It's hydroelectric, so that they use that water that standing water to to generate electricity but the standing water is a whole different world in flowing water okay standing water is so different okay and water in itself is, is kind of kind of strange but basically uh, water uh, water is like like air we've all heard hot air rises hot water rises okay so now let's visualize if you will standing water, a reservoir full of water. I don't care if it's a big reservoir or a little one, but it's, it's, it's standing water. It's not moving, it's just sitting there, okay? Uh, granted, there's some wave action and all that, but basically it's just sitting there, all right? Now, the water is getting sun from the top, okay? Is the sun warmer than usually the water? Yeah. So the top water is getting warmed, okay? And this is in the, in the summertime, okay? In the summertime, uh, and it can't go anywhere because it's being warmed from the top and you get a little wave action So it mixes a little but it's, it can't go down because it's it's warmer than the water underneath it So what happens during the entire summer and, and I'm sorry, but around here summer lasts forever Okay, but in the summertime what happens is you end up with all that water on the surface in, in our standing water uh, like right here in in, in, uh, in Bernie Bernie City Lake per perfect example Okay, for about the first 30 feet of water, you know, uh, it's pretty constant temperature, okay, uh, because, but then you end up with the bottom water, you know, it's being basically pushed down to the bottom, and it's so much colder, and they can't mix. So all summer long, you have set up what we call, on the top, it's called an epilimnion, in the middle, it's called a, a metalimnion, uh, and, and then underneath it is the cold water that never moves. All summer long, it's sitting down there, it's stuck because it's colder than, than the surface water, and it's called the hypolimnion. What happens is all of the nutrients and, and detritus and things like that filter down all the, the things, all, all kinds, just kind of go down to the bottom, and decomposition is occurring down there, but there's no exchange of anything, so there's no oxygen. It burns it all up. So anything below about 30 feet, there's no fish down there all summer long. There's no oxygen. Okay, they have to stay up in the shallower water, and uh, in a big reservoir, it accounts for a large percentage, if you will, of the total volume of water. It just sits there. But now here comes the fall. Here comes the northers. Okay, the cold norther comes, hits. What does that do? First of all, the wind is blowing like crazy. The temperature is colder than that surface water, and the waves are rolling like that. And that water is being subjected to that coldness. It starts sinking. Okay, and eventually, and then the warmer water that's underneath it comes up to the top. And here comes the northern blowing on it some more. It just keeps doing that. It's called the fall turnover. And basically the whole thing turns and when that surface water gets colder than the bottom water, <laughs> she turns. And, and it all comes up, all right? Now, I tell people, I, I fish over at Bernie City Lake all the time. It's my favorite place to fish. I'll go out there in the late fall after a couple hard northers. I'll fish in 50 feet of water and I'll catch, I'll catch fish on the bottom. 
People say, what are you doing? I said, I'm going where the fish are. All those things that live down there in an, in an anoxic you know, situation, there are animals that can do it, okay? Uh, they're, all of a sudden, they're available for, for predators to come down there and feed on them. So anyway, but you have that, that turnover. That's what happens in standing water, okay? And uh, so you've got that temperature gradient, then in the, all winter long, Every time a hard norther comes, or this horrible freeze we had this year, that's turning that water. Man, it's turning it. All that cold, cold, cold surface water sinking right to the bottom. What's really cool about water, and we don't have to worry about it down here because we're too far south, but what's really weird about water is, is hot water rises, cold water settles to a limit. And that limit is four degrees centigrade. Four degrees is the most dense water, okay? So if it didn't, Okay, so what happens in the fall is when that water temperature gets below four degrees, it becomes less, less dense. It comes to the surface. That's why ice forms on the surface. Otherwise, it would form on the bottom. Now, what would that do? That would tear the world up if it went all the way to the bottom. So anyway, that's what's, what's weird about it. We don't have to worry about that down here. I've never seen Bernie City Lake freeze over. I have seen the, the Guadalupe freeze over in Kerrville. It did it this year a little bit. But uh, uh, anyway, that's what's, what's kind of strange. And it only happens in the standing water environments, okay? All right. Uh, and that's, uh, again, we went through the seasonal part of it. Uh, you have the, the, the mixing on the surface and then the turnover in the fall and all that. That's what happens. Now let's talk just a very briefly about water issues. Um, probably the biggest one is, is actually the land use practices, you know, poor land use practices. One of the classic things that we've had to deal with in Texas is overgrazing. Uh, people, you know, run way too many animals on a, on a given piece of property near the water, and then you denude the vegetation, and here comes the rain, and then you have all the, all the uh, erosion and whatnot. You can go look at any, any hill country stream uh, where there's a halfway decent steep hillside, and you have all the rocks and stuff just pouring down into the water, and it's because all the soil that held them together, you know, is, is, is gone. And, and, and then you go down in the stream bed itself, and you just see vast expanses. Uh, go down to Camp Wood sometime and go look at the Oasis River down there. It's just vast expanses of gravel, you know, that uh, because uh, the stream has accumulated all of that debris, if you will, from, from the, the poor land use practices uh, of, you know, Unfortunately, we, we still have a, have a problem. And our society thinks that more is better. <laughs> more is sometimes more. That's all it is. So anyway, poor land use practices. And of course, uh, being as hot as it is, we have droughts down here. And when the water, when the water goes away, uh, just you know, in terms of the aquatic environment, it's devastating. I mean, we have fish kills. I mean, you have to start over. Mother Nature is very resilient. But uh, my gosh, it can get ugly out there. You know. When you have, when you have that, just before all the fish die, it's it's nasty. <laughs> you know they're they're running out of oxygen and, and uh, anyway, so a lot of it is, is because of of, uh, of you know, a combination, if you will, of the climate and the uh, and the, the people that live here and what they do. Uh, we also have a problem with uh, 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 nutrient enrichment, if you will. Uh, septic systems. Uh, you can go to any of, the, any of these areas around here and you go get, get off, off the paved highway a little bit and you'll find ranches out there that they have, you know, septic systems that just they don't work with a flip. Uh, we have a lot of people and where do you want to build? You want to build next to the water. It's so cool to be by a stream. And then all that nutrients goes into the stream. Next thing you know, we've got this aquatic vegetation and whatnot. There's places uh, uh, in Kerrville where you can practically walk across these small streams in the summertime, you know, without getting, you know, without fall falling in because the vegetation is absolutely so thick. That, and it's strictly because it's, it's fertilizer, you know. So we have a, an issue with that. You know, water quality is, is, is hard to maintain, but it's so important. Um, and... Uh, so it's just, you can find examples. Another thing that we have to be concerned about with the aquatic environment is, is invasive exotics. Um, I tell people, and, and, and it's, it's true, that's, well, at least I think it's true, you can buy anything you want in this world with a few clicks of this mouse, okay? And they'll ship it to you. And I guarantee you the people that are shipping it to you from another country could care less what damage it does when it gets here. 
And then you go out and buy something. You say, oh, I had to get this thing from whoever. I got it from wherever. You bring it to your house. You put it in your aquarium. Oh, my gosh, it's getting too big. And I don't have the heart to kill it. So I'll go turn it loose. I'll go turn it loose in the creek behind the house. Or I'll take it to Bernie City Lake and turn it loose. You know, I remember years ago when Bernie was rel Bernie City Lake was relatively young, somebody, somebody caught a um, piranha over there. Yes. And it's just, you know, so we have a problem with exotics. We have Asian clams. Um, you know, the people my age uh, that, that dealt with the Vietnam War, uh, a lot of folks brought, brought people back, if you will, from Southeast Asia. And they, part of their, their diet and their culture was, was a species of clams. They, they, they liked them. And they're not here in North America, naturally. Well, they are now. They're everywhere. I picked one up yesterday when we were out at uh, the lake in Kerrville collecting fish. They're all over North America because people turn them loose. Uh, lots of examples of that. Tilapia. We caught a tilapia yesterday in, in, in uh, uh, Flat Rock Lake in Kerrville. What are you doing there? That's an exotic. And, and uh, uh, anyway, uh, if you want to want to see something really sad, go down Highway 90 between Brackettville and, and uh, Del Rio. And just before you get into Del Rio, you cross a creek. And there's a little park there, and you can go stand on the bridge and look in the creek, and you see these black fish that are about this big. They're everywhere. They're just swarms of them. They're armored catfish. They're from, I think, Africa. Again, a, a release from, from somebody's aquarium, and they just, you know, unfortunately, when these exotics, you know, get turned loose in a new environment, in the absence of their natural checks and balances, you know, it doesn't take a wizard to figure out what's going to happen, and they can do some unbelievable damage. And unfortunately, with a lot of them, once they're there, they're not going away. Water hyacinths, my God, the amount of money in Texas that gets spent spraying water hyacinths because somebody at a World's Fair in, I think it was New Orleans, brought them in because from wherever they came from because they were so beautiful. And now they just take over the world. Um, anyway, so exotics are, are, are something we need to be concerned about, so be careful with that. I always end my presentation to a nat Mr. Naturalist, or actually for any group, with a plea for advocacy. And when I say adv advocacy, I'm talking about advocacy for the natural environment. That's what it's all about for people like me. And uh, I don't have to really do that with natural naturalists because you're already there. You already love the environment, or you wouldn't be sitting here today. Okay. Anyway, um, with that, does anybody have any questions? I would love to. The point of advocacy. Uh, on the Sabinaw River, uh, there's a group, um, young life group, that wants to uh, get a permit to uh, discharge their treated uh, wastewater into the Sabinaw River. And so there's a petition going around to people sign up and say, uh, we don't want to allow this. Uh, so what do you think about that? Because it's treated, so it's going to be probably cleaner than the water that's in the river now. And so it might actually supplement um, the water in the, in the river uh, as opposed to being well sewage. It's not going to be well sewage. It's going to be treated. Right. Um, your opinion on that? I definitely have an opinion on that. Um, I think the key element that you mentioned was treatment. Okay. Uh, I. For example, I can remember going to a public hearing f for a, a situation in Kerrville that was similar to that. Uh, a, a large entity wanted to discharge some water into a creek, and uh, uh, they were their plans. Uh, uh, w they worked very closely with the environmental groups and 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 what. And basically, let's just say they were going to do it right. The water, as you pointed out, the water that was going to be going back into the into the creek or the river, whatever it happens to be, was going to be better than the water that was already there. And I was amazed, I was shocked, I was appalled, if you will, the number of people who showed up and said, you can't put that, that that's sewage waste going into the, it's, listen to what you're being told. It's better than what was already there. My response to them was, you know, the critters that are supposed to be in that water system they have to have water. <laughs> so if you don't discharge it, okay, then you're taking water out of something and, and you're reducing the amount of habitat that's available for, for the animals there. So my response is bring it on, you know. But 
it, it has to be has to be good stuff. You can't put junk out there. But if they're going to do it right, and you can do it right, okay? Good question. I know they do it here just right at the You bet. The you bet. You bet. Um, so kind of looking at what we have here as our local river or creek, whatever, um, when we look at fish here in Uri, the effects from Uri, what did most of the fish here die as a result of maybe not having the depth of water that they would need to survive Storm Uri? Forgive my ignorance, but what is Storm Uri? Is this the coal thing? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, again, I, I, somewhere amongst all the things that I said, I said Mother Nature can be pretty cruel sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's not unusual for, for, for natural occurrences to have devastating impacts. But what you have to remember is that's only, those are isolated things. If, 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 and, and, and Mother Nature is, is very adaptable. I mean, that's what makes nature work, is the ability to evolve. That's why we're here, okay? Because we were able to evolve. And, and if, you can't, if you can't, you know, uh, evolve, you're gonna go away, be replaced by something else. So it's not unusual for something like a, a catastrophic weather event to wreak havoc. I mean, I've got, I hope I'm wrong, I think I have a dead tree that's 15 years old in my backyard. You know, I mean, it's, I'm still waiting for the first sign of any life on it whatsoever, and I'm too old to start over, <laughs> you know? But uh, it happens. Mother Nature can do that. And yes, uh, uh, it, if it gets cold enough out there, it can kill anything that's not built to withstand that temperature but it's it's a it's a dynamic flowing situation people fish and the invertebrates and all the other things will rehabitate you know they'll they'll come in and take it it, it pretty, not only does it does it kill a bunch of stuff and make you feel bad about it but it creates at the same time it creates a wonderful opportunity for something else to come in there and more often than not, on a short-term basis, it's the same stuff that used to be there. You know, I tell ranchers, you know, if, if I kill all the fish in my pond, you know, what's going to happen? Well, you know, if there's water upstream, you're gonna, it's going to repopulate, okay? And uh, uh, so, I don't know if that answers your question, but basically, I wouldn't get too excited about it. Because in, in the, I mean, it might break your heart to, to see all these dead fish laying there or something like that. but. In the big scheme of things, don't worry about it. It's fine. You know? And it, if it's if it's catastrophic enough to where it's not going to be fine, it's not going to make any difference to us either, is it? Because <laughs> we're not going to be here. So I mean, it, it just don't don't worry about it. It's fine. Um, it's just Mother Nature doing what Mother Nature does. I mean, why is COVID here? <laughs> you know, I mean, these things happen. That's Mother Nature, doing what Mother Nature does. You know, thinning the herd. Yes, ma'am. So in Calaveras Lake, the red drum that are there, is that an adaptation? Um, or is that a type of fish that can go from salt water to fresh water with no? Yes. Okay. <laughs> the fresh, fresh, I mean, uh, red drum are what we call an estuarine species. Estuaries are, are, in essence, they're a mixture of, it's where salt water and fresh water meet. It's, so it's not total salt, it's not the same as open ocean water, okay, that's about 30, 38 parts per thousand salinity, and the river is probably zero parts per thousand salinity. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15, you know, I mean, it varies with the tides and the wind and all that good stuff. But the species of fish that live in our estuaries, Okay, where the saltwater and freshwater mix, they have the ability to withstand because they live in a constantly changing environment. You know, here comes a flood, all the water rushing down the river, it's all fresh water. It's like, oh my God, I'm a saltwater fish, I'm gonna die. No, you're not because you're an estuarine species. You can handle that fresh water, okay? That people catch red fish, red drum, if you will, up the rivers all the time. They catch them up because they can go up there. There's several, several species that do that, you know, commonly. Red drum is one of them. So Parks and Wildlife took advantage of that opportunity when they said, this is a fish that can handle fresh water. 
So now we've got these uh, heated reservoirs, if you will, like Calaveras and, and Braunig right next door to it. They use natural gas, I believe, is what they run off of to, uh, maybe, I don't think they're coal fired, I think they're natural gas. But anyway, they use the water from the lake to, to cool the, the turbines when they make electricity. Well, that creates an artificially elevated water temperature, so you have a, 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 a much warmer situation out there. Uh, so it's kind of, the whole thing is kind of fake to begin with, you know what I mean? Uh, it's for a very, you know, very good purpose, but, but Parks and Wildlife said, well, if we stock Red Drum in there, we will create an opportunity for people to catch something. It's, they're good to eat, you know, they can survive, there's plenty of forage out there, there's tilapia, because somebody put those out there. You know, I mean, we have all these things that we'd like to get rid of. So it was kind of a, that's, that's basically what that, that's all about. And yes, they can, now what they cannot do, okay, they cannot reproduce because they have to go into the open ocean to spawn. That's where they, that's where they spawn. So they can live there, they can prosper, and they can die there, but they will not reproduce there. Do they stop those? They have to restock them from time to time. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Very popular, I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, I've caught them, and oh, it's I just, know. they're wonderful, they're, they're no different. If you look at them, if you eat them, <laughs> if you, whatever you want to do with them, they're exactly the same as a redfish that you caught in, in Aransas Bay, except you didn't have to drive all the way over there to do it. And while they're there, they're chowing down on a bunch of these exotics that we'd like to get rid of. <laughs> so it's kind of a win-win, okay? Does that answer your, yes. answer your question? You. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned all these fish we're going to get to see. How many places did you have to go to find this variety? We went to Flat Rock Lake in in, uh, in Kerrville, uh -huh. and uh, we used a, a, the best fishing technique that I know of. It's called an electrofishing boat. It's uh, like the old days of the telephone. You know, let's crank them up. Uh, basically, has a generator, and we, we put an electric charge into the water. It temporarily stuns the fish. It doesn't kill them, uh, and it allows you while they're while they're they're stunned, you just scoop them up with a net, and uh, you know you can. You can do whatever you need to do with them. Uh, it, this obviously is, would be illegal for people like you to use, but for the purposes of, of this, uh, you know, um, because I'm retired, I don't have a collecting permit anymore. I had to give that up when I retired, but uh, the people that were in the boat were Parks and Wildlife folks, and they have collecting permits. So um, you know, if a warden came by, we can have anything we want in the boat. And my objective was to get as many species as I could to show you as many different kinds of fishes as I could. Um, the truth is, if we went to multiple places, we might have caught a couple different additional species, but it wouldn't have been worth the effort. Uh, I, I think we probably got, I'm guessing, 20, 25 species, something like that. Um, and I mean, we've, we've collected them. That, that's, that's our bread and butter place to go just because, I mean, for years we did this at the Lions Camp in, in Kerrville, and then we did it at the library here in Bernie, now we're doing it here. I mean, I don't care where I go. Uh, but uh, it's just a place that's convenient, you know. I live there, the, the shocking boat lives nearby, and the people that I used to work with, uh, you know, enjoy doing it. Uh, and you guys hopefully can learn something from it. So uh, uh, if we'd gone to Ingram Lake, for example, or, or in any other place we could have gone to, we might have added one species, but probably not. So. Uh, as a matter of fact, yesterday when we were out there, we, we were rocking along and, you know, I have a mental list in my head of what we're going to want to get. Anything that we've ever seen, I want it. And we had all these things, we're checking them off in my head, and after a couple of hours, I turned to the gentleman driving the boat, and I just went like that, and he said, where are we? I said, we're one species away. And I said, and this is a species we find about every five years. I said, I don't think it's worth our time. So, I mean, they had other things to do. And I was hungry. It was the lunchtime. <laughs> so there. But anyway, if, if you'll give me a few minutes, I'll clear all this stuff off of here. I'll go get the fish in the cooler over there. I'll spread them all out, and then we can just come around, and you can get up close and personal, and feel free to ask any questions. And you'll see some of the, maybe the adaptations I was talking about. And uh, um, so there. Okay?